Hello everyone and welcome to another show the view video. This is a series in which I talk about a show that I've been in and give you a rough overview of what it was like to be in the show. I will talk you through the audition process to get into that show. I will talk you through a few memories, fond, wonderful, funny, silly, happy memories that I have from being in that show. Sometimes I will even have footage or props that I have, I wouldn't say stolen per se, because I definitely asked if I could take them, but maybe the people that I asked who said yes didn't actually have authority to let me take them out of the theatre, but just conveniently looked the other way when I stuffed it into my bag. However, the show that I'm talking about today is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, the UK tour in which I played Truly Scrumptious. And it is the one show that I have been a part of where I didn't actually take anything with me when I left. I promise you that. However, one of the cast members called Ross Russell, he taught himself to sew on the sewing machine and made me a tote bag out of scraps of material from all of my costumes, which is one of the most amazing presents I've ever been given. However, I do have photographs, like actual physical photographs from when I was in Chitty the first time around in London's West End at the London Palladium with da -da -da, Michael Ball. Look at that. That is little me and Michael Ball who played Caractacus Potts while I played Jemima Potts. Also, here is Paul O'Grady who played uh, the child catcher. Look at me in my iridescent metallic <laughs> purple coat. I can still feel that material. Someone else who played the child catcher is Peter Polly Carpu, who then also played Tenardier in Dubai when I played Eponine. And of course, the wonderful Brian Blessed played Baron Bombus when I was a kid. And maybe one of my favourite photos that I have from when I was a child in the show is this lovely photo that I took of Anton Rogers who played Grandpa Potts. But right there in the corner is none other than John McRae, who played the original Jamie in Everybody's Talking About Jamie. <laughs> you know that saying, you can take the kid out of the theatre, but you can't take the theatre out of the kid? With me and John, neither is true. You can't take the theatre out of the kid, and you can't take the kid out of the theatre, apparently. Being in Chitty as a kid was such an amazing experience, but when I was a child, I didn't understand the weight and gravitas to opening an original West End show. I was in the original cast. I was one of five, 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 three, four. <laughs> I can't remember anymore. I think I was one of, I think there were five Jane Banks when I was in Mary Poppins and there were three Jemimas. The audition process for that was extreme. I think I had nine auditions in the end. And I think the main issue was that Jeremy and Jemima are twins, so you needed to find sets of kids who looked realistically like they could be twins. But when I was a child, working with Michael Ball, Anton Rogers, Nicola McAuliffe, Brian Blessed, Emma Williams, like all of these names sort of went over my head when I was a nine-year-old kid. However, Michael Ball didn't because I knew he was the original Marius, so I had a little bit of a fangirl when I met Michael Ball. And the entire experience of rehearsing and teching and opening a West End show, for me, and I think all of the kids that were in that show, it was just fun. It wasn't school. We were missing a lot of school to be in it. And we were clearly a bunch of kids that loved performing and we were being given a chance to do that to the extreme on a West End stage. So every child in that show was just having the best time and not really feeling the same sort of pressures that maybe the adult cast were feeling um, when it came to opening a big new West End show. But we're not here to talk about that. We are here to talk about the UK tour when I played Truly Scrumptious, but I'm putting in the context about why it meant so much to me to play Truly Scrumptious and hopefully with that context um, of, you know, how much that show meant to me and meant to my family as well. My parents were of the generation that watched the movie when that first came out in 1968. So to then have their daughter in the original West End production was, you know, kind of mind blowing to them and they loved the show so much. So then when I got the call to say, you've got an audition for Truly Scrumptious for the UK tour. 
um, that was a very big deal. And I toyed with the um, notion of not telling my parents before I went because that's a lot of pressure. I um, very rarely tell anyone that I've got an audition for something. I usually tell people after it's happened. I just hate waking up on the day of an audition to text messages from my parents or some of my family or my friends being like, good luck, break a leg. Um, because I get nervous enough as it is with the pressure that I put on myself. And it's not that my friends and family are putting pressure on me, but then I put more pressure on myself because more people know about it, if that makes any sense. So usually I opt for telling no one. And then as soon as I am out of the audition, I will call people up and be like, hey, I just had an audition for this. This is how it went. Fingers crossed. <laughs> but I think I did tell my mum, who in turn definitely would have told my dad. <laughs> But this was a very quick turnaround for this audition. I had one audition for Truly. Do you remember in the last video where I said that there were some audition processes where it was like, you've got an audition tomorrow and then you find out really quickly? Well, this is pretty much one of those times and this is the quickest that I ever found out that I had a part. So I've got an email here from the 15th of January, 2016. Oh my God, so almost six, six years ago. <sighs> I'm old. And it's got a Dropbox link that I've checked. There's nothing in it, everything's been deleted. <laughs> but it contained all of the Truly Scrumptious material that I needed to learn. I think it was a couple of songs. I remember it being Doll on a Music Box and possibly Truly Scrumptious and a couple of scenes with Caractacus Pots. So that was on the 15th and I found an email from my mum. I don't know why she emailed me and didn't text me, but I found an email from my mum saying that she was proud of me for getting the part on the 25th first so my audition definitely would have been on the 21st because I did the audition at like two o'clock in the afternoon I was still in Les Mis at this point um and I went back to the theatre because I had a show that evening and by about four o'clock that afternoon so a couple hours later I found out that I had been offered the part of Truly Scrumptious and it was mine if I wanted it and confession time I had been offered a different job um, before I was offered the role of Truly Scrumptious. Now that is like the dream for any actress to have two wonderful jobs to choose between. Um, however, the job that I had been offered prior to Truly Scrumptious was only 10 performances over the course of like six weeks because it was part of a festival. It was one show that was part of lots of shows that were showing at the same time at the same venue. Um, and it just made more sense to take a job that was doing eight shows a week for like six months. And also Truly Scrumptious came with the, um, it came with all the feels when I got the role of Truly Scrumptious. It was one of those moments that my agent always laughs about um, because very often when I am given a role that I am like really hoping to get, I just burst into tears, but then it means that I can't speak. So my agent will call up and be like, so we've had an offer through for the role of Truly Scrumptious. Carrie? Carrie, you there? And it's just me sobbing on the other end of the phone, not being able to speak because I'm so choked up. And getting the role of Truly Scrumptious was one of those moments because it just meant so much to me. And I also could imagine myself calling my mum up and telling her. So I said yes, then and there. I was like, yes except very quick very snappy still to this day the quickest that i have ever received a role after auditioning so the thing about chitty that was a very new experience for me is the fact that the tour was 18 months long but i was just joining for the middle five or six months i think it was six months with rehearsals so the tour had started in the previous year it started in leeds and then they started touring and moving around the country and the truly before me was amy griffiths the wonderful amy griffiths who was just so kind to me um when i was rehearsing for truly i shadowed her for a performance in stoke I believe and shadowing is such a wonderful experience both ways round. I've shadowed someone and I've had someone shadow me and I think if you love theatre it's the most exciting thing to have someone with you whilst you're performing. So for anyone who doesn't know shadowing someone is basically when you become someone's shadow for a show and you follow them around the theatre and you take notes and you learn their track 
and what they do. And when I was shadowing Amy, she was just so kind with all of her like inside info, telling me things that she'd picked up, that she'd learned how to do, that just made her life easier. Um, like setting a prop down in a slightly different place to where she'd been told because then it was easier when she had to pick that prop back up again. It was closer to where she needed it for the next time. Letting me know exactly how long we had between scenes. So she'd be like, you know, at this point you could probably make yourself a cup of tea and you'll be able to drink about half of it before you have to be back on stage again or like if you boil the kettle now you'll be able to get back here by the time it's boiled because you're only on stage for like two minutes at this point it was just wonderful to experience the show from behind the scenes before i actually got to step into the role of truly it was a very strange experience having to rehearse scenes with just me and Lee Mead. Lee Mead was playing Cracticus Potts. We were joining the cast at the same time. Um, he would be leaving two weeks before I was due to leave um, because he was off on a tour of his own. But it was very strange doing rehearsals with just the two of us, knowing full well that at some point this stage is going to be filled with people who currently aren't here in the rehearsal room. So whatever we learn now is probably going to change dramatically whenever we get on stage with people. And when we get on stage with people will probably be the day before we go on stage for real for our opening show. But Joe Goodwin, the associate choreographer, and Emily Kempson, the associate director, were the most amazing team. They were so patient, they were so understanding, they were so on it. They knew exactly where we had to be, when we had to be there, what props we had, how long we had for quick changes. They were just amazing. And so I felt so prepared when I finally got to uh, South End to do our dress run. Now this is the other weird thing. Tours work so differently uh, when it comes to holidays. Whenever you're in like a year long contract in a West End show, you get 28 days holiday that you get to pick and decide amongst yourselves with your company manager. Certain people aren't allowed off with other people because if you have too many people off who cover the same role, suddenly you run out of people to play that role and disaster strikes. However, when it comes to a tour, now I don't know if this is different with other production companies because both tours that I've done have been with the same production company, they schedule in holidays for the entire cast. So there will just be a week when Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was not showing anywhere in the country and the entire cast were on holiday that week. Now, I had my dress rehearsal for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in South End, and then the entire cast went on holiday for a week. And then we were in Milton Keynes a week later, and we would be opening as Caractacus Potts and Truly Scrumptious on the first day in Milton Keynes. So we did our dress rehearsal and then had a week to forget everything. <laughs> and then had our opening night in Milton Keynes a week later. It was a little bit terrifying, I will be honest. The other thing about Chitty is that the star of the show is the title character. It's the car. The car is a very big piece of machinery and automation. And when you are moving around the country, sometimes that automation doesn't want to play ball and just doesn't want to work the same way that it worked in the last venue. So on our opening night, um, <laughs> We had a show stop just before Truly Scrumptious um, and the song before Truly Scrumptious is the title song Chitty Chitty Bang Bang when everyone sings Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and it's, I think it's the first time that that's ever sung um, and the car is meant to sort of like move side to side and projections would like roll past making it you know look like we were moving at quite a pace. Um, and the car just wasn't moving left and right as it should. So as the car parks at the beach for them to sing Truly Scrumptious and have their like Truly Scrumptious sweet moment with the kids, an announcement plays out over the theatre um, to say that there had been a technical difficulty and the curtain starts to come down. Problem is, this is Lee Mead's first show as Caractacus Potts. And usually the announcements for show stops and when things go wrong are pre-recorded by the person who plays Caractacus Potts. Lee hadn't done his recordings yet, so the recording that suddenly played out over the tannoy wasn't Lee Mead, who has quite a neutral, like, southern accent. 
it was very, very northern Jason Manford who had previously played the role. And the best part of that was is that me, Lee and the children hadn't gotten off stage yet. So we were like lifting the children out of the car whilst <laughs> just listening to this announcement that neither of us had heard. <laughs> Looking at each other like, thank you. The other thing about the Chitty Tour is that we had a lot of cast changes whilst on the road. Um, we started the tour with Sean Williams and Michelle Collins playing Baron and Baroness Bombburst. And then I can't remember how long into the tour, but maybe a few months in, um, we had a cast change and Phil Jupitus and Claire Sweeney switched over and joined us as Baron and Baroness Bombburst. This is also the tour where I met my beloved friend, Scott Page. Believe it or not, I have now known Scott for six whole years, which blows my mind. But the story of us meeting always makes me laugh because he obviously knew that someone was coming in to play Truly Scrumptious after Amy left. But by the time I had met him, the producer had asked me to go and watch the show a few times in the week that I was rehearsing with the cast in Stoke. So I obviously knew his face because I'd watched him on stage a few times. And it turned out that we were both staying in the same hotel without realising, because why would we? And I was checking into the hotel and about to go up to my room as he was coming downstairs to go over to the theatre. So the lift doors open in the lobby and he's there and we both have this moment of like... I want to say hi, but is, is, is that him? Am I about to make a tit out of myself if I say hello and that's not who that is? And so we both had this really awkward moment of being like, <sighs> as we sort of like walked around each other for me to get into the lift and him to get out of it. And it was only until we got to the theatre later on that day when we were both like, did I see you at the lift? Are we at the same hotel? Chitty was also my first ever experience of booking digs. Now for those of you that don't know, when you go on tour, you are responsible for booking your own accommodation. You get given a tour allowance, which I think at the time of me being on tour with Chitty was £235 a week. There are some places that you can book digs and you will have money left over um, to save up to book somewhere maybe nicer down the line. In other places, it's near impossible and you are just going to have to suck it up and bite the bullet and pay over the odds for somewhere that's probably a bit grimy. And I have been on two UK tours now and as hard as I try to line up all of my digs ahead of time, <sighs> I never manage it. I always book about five in advance, then I'm like, it's fine. By the time I get to the last one, I will have booked the next five, it's fine. And then everywhere gets booked up and so by the time you get to that last venue that you've booked, you're scrounging and scrambling to find anywhere to stay you're like at this point i will sleep under someone's stairs and pay them a hundred pounds a night i just need somewhere to stay please there are two digs on the chitty tour that come to mind one of them was the first digs that i shared with scott page there were a few of us staying there i think there were about four of us staying in this flat but it was in the middle uh, or above a shopping centre. So you had to walk through the shopping centre, past a Millie's Cookies where there was a lift, and then the lift took you upstairs to these really weird apartments that were above the shopping centre that you for some reason couldn't see from the street outside when you were looking at the shopping centre. It was bizarre. Really nice flat, but bizarre. And the other digs, me, Scott Page and Ross Russell, all got a seven hour train. <laughs> By the time we got there it was maybe like seven eight o'clock at night and someone else had booked these digs for us but it was a house that had 10 bedrooms it was massive but as we walked up this winding path as the light was draining from the sky it was this weird massive manor house on this hill and it felt like the beginnings of a, a horror movie or like a really dark slasher. And as we got closer to the house, we noticed that every window in this huge, huge manor house that had loads of windows, in every window was a vote leave poster, which didn't fill us with any comfort whatsoever. The house was amazing. It was absolutely incredible, um, but definitely haunted 
it had these very eerie weird paintings everywhere that scared the crap out of us definitely eyes that like watched you move and i found a room it was kind of a, a free-for-all we all got to pick our own rooms and so i found this lovely room with a double bed very high ceilings um dumped my stuff got my toiletries took it into the bathroom as i come back into my room scott page is in my bed i was like what are you doing babe what's what's this what's going on and at this point we don't know each other very well you know we'd become like good friends but we don't we didn't know each other back then obviously as well as we know each other now so to find scott page in my bed i was like what what's going on and he was like babe i can't i can't sleep in that room and i was like why and he was like it's definitely haunted and the pictures definitely watch me i can't stay there <laughs> Um, and so we shared a double bed for that <laughs> for that entire venue because Scott was convinced that not only the house was haunted but that his room in particular was haunted and that is the beginning of our friendship and I have a video that is still to this day one of my favourite videos ever of the first time Scott made me belly laugh and it was because he was trying to film a video to i think it was a fan of his someone who had been messaging him a lot and he was trying to do a really sweet video but he kept screwing it up and it kept making him laugh and then it kept making me laugh and so it's this stupid video that i will show now of him starting the video and then making this ridiculous noise that just brought this belly laugh out of me and i couldn't even stand up straight i literally doubled over and it's just one of my favorite videos ever no worries <laughs> I feel like I have so many stories from this tour that I had completely forgotten so I'm going to pick three and I'm going to tell you those three stories and then I'm going to shut up. First story is from my first ever experience of doing a curtain speech. Now a curtain speech is when after the bows and after the curtain call and everyone's applauding someone steps forward and gives a speech usually for a charity or for a special occasion um, and usually it's one of the principal characters and for some reason I had been entrusted and this is the reason that I will point blank refuse to ever do a curtain speech again because it's too much pressure <laughs> if I can be a character on stage I will live my best life if I have to be me on stage I will hate every second of it so doing a curtain speech is like my worst nightmare and it's also extra stuff that you have to memorize pretty quickly and not screw it up and that was literally all I thought about for the entirety of this show and not only that the curtain speech was for esophageal cancer um which is maybe one of the hardest words to say ever obviously a wonderful cause but that was also something that I was worried I was going to trip over. The charity was called Esophagus. I remember this so clearly because it's one of my most embarrassing moments ever and it will uh, haunt me forevermore. There were three people who were working front of house who were doing a fun run to raise money for this charity. I think the third name was either Christopher or Robert, which is hysterically two of my cousin's names, I can't I think it might have been Christopher but I can't remember but the two names that I do remember are Ainsley and Heather now the reason I remember these two names is because when I was rehearsing this speech I kept saying Ainsley Harriet and I was like no don't say that because the, the Ainsley Harriet isn't running this fun run Ainsley and Heather are what do I do I get up there and tell everyone that Ainsley Harriet is running this fun run um and everyone starts like giggling because <laughs> obviously Ainsley Harriet is not running this fun run um, to which I have to then be like did I say Ainsley Harriet I meant Ainsley and Heather Ainsley Harriet is not running this fun run um, and it was maybe one of the most embarrassing moments I have ever had on stage so I've learnt my lesson I um, should never be trusted with curtain speeches and I will never be saying yes to doing one again I will hand that responsibility over to someone far more capable than I my second story is when the gorgeous Lee Mead who is just one of the the nicest people and one of the best people you could ever possibly hope to work with and it was right at the beginning of the show where i'm waiting in the wings for the first couple numbers um to come on on my automated motorbike and lee mead has to push the wrecked burnt out version of chitty chitty bang bang that's in like the scrapyard he has to push it back and as he pushed it back he tripped and fell and hurt his arm and whilst i'm in the wings i can s i'm looking through like the the pieces of set and i can see him on the floor clutching his arm and i was like lee Leah, you're right and it's like ah like really hurt 
So I turned to whoever was close to me and was like, Lee's hurt his arm, can we make sure that he's okay? And the show didn't stop, so I assumed that, you know, word had got to him, someone had asked him if he's okay, and he was like, no, no, I'm fine, let's carry on, let's carry on. So I go on on my motorbike, and as I go on, Lee's got to stop me, and it's all, like, automated, it's someone in the wings, like, pressing a button to make the motorbike come and go. I've got no control over it whatsoever. This is important for the rest of the story, remember that. I have no control over whether this bike moves or not. And Lee stops the bike, but he's still clutching his arm, and I'm like, oh my god, he's broken his arm, he's broken his arm, like, panic, panic, panic. He hadn't. He was okay, he just really hurt himself. Long story short, we ended up skipping half a scene. <laughs> And it got to the point where we had got ourselves so lost in these lines that Lee just said to me, you should be off now, shouldn't you? And I was like, good day, sir. And I have these like little goggles on and I got on the motorbike and I'm looking up into the wings where Oliver, who was part of our team, our stage management team, and he's there ready to press the button. But obviously we haven't said the cue line yet that usually would alert him to press the button because we've not gotten to that part in the scene yet. We have skipped all of it. So he's just chatting to someone with his finger literally like hovering over the button there. So I've gone, good day, sir. And I've done that and sound obviously at the back of this, the, the stalls watching so they can see me and they've done like the, the revving noise. The bike's not moved. So I'm like looking into the wings like, I said, good day, sir. Nothing. Oliver's just stood there like, I said, good day, sir. And by now I'm panicking. So I'm like, am I just going to have to get off the bike and walk? So I try one more time and he's like, <gasps> quickly presses the button. And thank God I move. And he was like, I'm so sorry. What happened? What happened? And I was like, I felt like I had done eight shows in the space of five minutes. And I came off stage and I was like, I don't know, but I never want to do that again. And finally, my third story is from when Jason Manford played Caractacus Potts with me. Because as I said earlier, Lee had to leave two weeks before I did um, to go off and do his own tour, which meant that Jason Manford, who was the next Caractacus Potts coming in, we had a two week overlap where we got to be Potts and Trudy together. And Jason has become a dear, dear friend. He is... <laughs> so lovely, so funny, such a sweet person, um, and we had such a blast in Northampton, which was my final venue. However, <laughs> and I will never ever let him live this down, right at the end of the show, I don't think this is a spoiler because the film came out in 1968, um, although does this happen in the film? I don't think it does actually. Basically at the end of the show, Caractacus Potts proposes to Truly, and she says yes, and they have a kiss and then they get in the car and basically they end the show as a family. So I'm stood by the car and say, this is the car here and you're the audience. I'm stood here and Potts is down here. And he says something, he turns to Truly and says something like Truly and calls her down and he walks over here and I walk around the car and so then I'm here. So now I'm here and he's here and we're facing each other. And he says Truly and gets down on one knee and says, please, and she says yes and takes his hand and then they kiss and we're oh, happily ever after. So I'm stood by the car. I'm here. Jason's here. And he doesn't say truly. And he just walks up to the car opposite me. And everyone just watches him walk back to the car. And I'm just looking at him like... And the pause just went on for so long that Andy Hockley, who played Grandpa Potts, whose line it is after the proposal, he just had to carry on. He just had to keep going. And it was only until Andy said his line that Jason went and suddenly realized what he'd done. But by that point, it was too late. <laughs> we'd plowed on, we'd rolled over that moment. And so we just had to keep going. And so we had this one weird anomaly of a show where Potts and Truly did not get engaged. And the following day, I walked into my dressing room to this huge bouquet of red roses and in the card was the line that Jason was meant to say where he said, truly, please. <laughs> and I told him if I got a bouquet of roses every time he forgot a line, he could do it more often. 
But those are some of my favourite memories from the Chitty Tour. Um, and I left the Chitty Tour on October 2nd um, because my next job was to move on to Les Mis, Dubai. I had been asked back to Les Mis about halfway through the Chitty Tour um, to play Eponine at the end of the international tour. So everyone, again, had been on the tour before me and I was slotting in for the last five and a half weeks for the last venue in Dubai. So I left Chitty on October the 2nd of 2016 and I started rehearsals for Les Mis Dubai on the 17th of October and we had two weeks to rehearse, but more on that next time. Thanks for watching.